All right. Um, this uh, is this on. This microphone does not project. It's for the uh, yeah. video. <laughs> um, so, I, but do let me know if you can hear or can't hear, and we'll talk louder. Um, my name is Corey Hayden. I'm the director of the center, um, and it's a real delight to have you all here. Um, this is our penultimate, third to last. Um, Colloquium in our spring series, and it is a real delight to uh, welcome Rachel Prentice here to give a talk on her current work. Um, Dr. Prentice is an associate professor, congratulations, in uh, the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University. She did her BA in Comparative Literature at Columbia, and so we might ask you some literature questions at some point, um, and her PhD in the History and Anthropology of Science and Technology at MIT. Um, Rachel's work has been really, um, I think, a beacon for people interested in the anthropology of surgery. A few people in the room um, kind of following, following your footsteps in, uh, in some very nice ways. Um, really helping us figure out um, how to think about the phenomenology, um, the politics, the ethics of what happens in surgical theaters. Um, a place uh, not, for the, not for the faint of heart, I think. Um, and and her work has really um, brought us into questions of um, not just the phenomenology of training and apprenticeship, questions of how surgeons actually learn um, to do things, questions of embodiment as practice uh, in some really nice ways. But her current work is also um, pushing some of those concerns into the ethnography of um, simulation itself. Um, and I think, you know, from conversations that we've had, I mean, that work goes into uh, areas as diverse as space simulation, medical training, uh, and a range of other areas where simulation is, is at stake in terms of um, how we cultivate certain kinds of practices and how we cultivate an imagined um, field of intervention for human and not so human <laughs> instruments, right? Arms and the rest. Um, Rachel's book is uh, about to come out in the fall. Um, it's called Bodies in Formation, an Ethnography of Anatomy and Surgery Education uh, with Duke University Press. I'm very much looking forward to seeing that. So without further ado, um, I'd just like to welcome Rachel Prentice, and uh, we're very much looking to hear forward to hearing her tell us about control in the operating room. Thanks for coming, Rachel. So after that amazing introduction, I guess I'd better be postscript to my book. It's, it's also a little bit of old wine in new bottles. Um, there'll be stuff that people who've read the manuscript will have heard a little bit before, but hopefully not quite in this form. And what I'm trying to do is, as Corey mentioned in the book, I'm really trying to, to, to understand or trying to think about how surgical knowledge, how, how surgeons become surgeons, and particularly how they learn through embodied practices in the operating room. And in this paper, what I'm going to try to do is expand the focus a little bit. And there's, some st there's both to think about the rest of the operating team, anesthesiologists and nurses, but also to begin to think, um, what you'll hear towards the end is some of my discomfort with some of the ways that surgery has been characterized. And more broadly, medicine has been characterized in terms of individuals. And I'll get to that in the end. And that's a little bit, um, I would actually, this like to call on this very smart audience to help me with the last part of this paper because it's not a thousand percent worked out, um, maybe not even a hundred. So from the first time that surgeons put on scrubs, learn to wash their hands properly, and set foot in an operating room, they begin to learn techniques to control their bodies and limit harm to the patient. I've written elsewhere, and this is in the book, that control is a set of techniques and an ethical principle for surgeons. That is, surgeons learn techniques of the body, such as resting their arms on the patient's body to still their hands and limit harm. Although control is a significant ethical and technical principle for each individual in the operating room, I focus here on the ways the techniques of control create a positive economy that permeates operating room behavior. The word control originated in France in the 15th century within the emerging field of accounting. And a contrarole was a second set of books that accountants kept, or the, the emerging mercantilist accountants kept, 
to check against another set of books. The term's first use in English was in verb form in the 17th century. And the term arose with mercantilism and it evolved continuously, as often in conjunction with new industrial and technological practices. The concept's significance for industrialization can't be overstated. And this has a bearing on the development of surgery. Scholars interested in control as it relates to technology have called for research that socially and historically situates ideologies of control. And I'll come back to that at the end. This essay builds on work done by medical historian Thomas Schlick, who analyzed the development of surgical spaces to argue that operating rooms are modernist spaces of control. I agree with him, but what I want to do is to expand the idea to examine specific techniques of control among 21st century operating teams. I first encountered control as a concept in surgery in 2002, while I was doing participant observation in a major West Coast medical school that I call Coastal University. A surgeon, who I call Dr. Claire Franklin, and all of these are pseudonyms throughout the rest of the talk, so I'll stop using that ugly construction. Um, a surgeon who I call Dr. Claire Franklin described what she does as controlled violence. This striking phrase, along with controlled poisoning, its counterpart among anesthesiologists, forms part of the language practitioners use to describe their work. These two phrases crop up regularly, but not all that often, in discussions of surgery and anesthesia. The juxtaposition of control with violence serves as a reminder to surgeons that their work involves cutting, cutting open bodies, removing, rearranging, and repairing things, work that does violence, often extraordinary violence, to the patient's body. Similarly, the use of gases and liquids to the render the patient unconscious almost to the point of death is definitely poisoning. What holds these activities on the sides of ethically and clinically tenable behavior is first their function within a context of healing, and I don't want to lose sight of that. And second, the practices of control that surgeons, anesthesiologists, and other clinicians employ to prevent harm. As the phrases imply, Control signifies exercising restraint upon necessary surgical violence and anesthesiological poisoning. Over the course of nearly two, two years of fieldwork, both at Coastal and in a Canadian hospital system affiliated with an elite medical school called Urban University, I found control embedded into surgical techniques at all levels of practice. Here what I'm going to do is look at three moments when things go slightly wrong to examine control at work in surgical operating rooms. Operating team members employ at least three major types of control. Nurses keep track of small materials used in surgery by employing accounting techniques. Anesthesiologists use drugs and machines to create an artificial homeostasis in the patient's body. And surgeons use physical techniques to limit harm. So in the first, so several hours into a major liver surgery, a scrub nurse called out to the surgical team, I'm missing a sponge. A regular and frequent count of the small gauze swabs that surgeons use for everything from stopping seeping blood to mopping the sweat on their brows had come up short. Four surgeons, a chief, a surgical fellow, a chief resident, and a first year resident all stopped work. Their hands emerged from the patient's abdomen. They took cautious steps backward. The search for the sponge began in the abdomen, around the operating site, on the table. And finally, Dr. Marcus Alexander, the surgical fellow, nudged a dirty piece of gauze with his toe, pointing it out to Jane Reynolds, the scrub nurse. The sponge had been found. A circulating nurse picked it up with a non-sterile pair of tweezers and dropped it in a waste bin. Jane checked it off on her count, and the surgeons resumed work. Now, nurses in the operating room typically perform two types of work, scrub nurse and circulating nurse. The scrub nurse, as the name implies, scrubs her hands and dons gloves and a gown just like the surgeons. The scrub nurse then stands next to the tray of instruments and hands them to surgeons on request and takes them back when the surgeons finish with them. The best scrub nurses often learn to anticipate which instrument a surgeon will request. Circulating nurses remain available to procure any needed equipment that's not available on the table. So if they suddenly needed something, uh, they can call to the circulating nurse who can leave the room because the circulating nurse is not, not required to be sterile in the same way as everybody who's right around the patient. Um, 
In both cases, the nurses must manage the movement of instruments and materials into and back out of the sterile operating field. The work of a scrub nurse requires enormous concentration and observation skills, as well as detailed knowledge of surgical materials. Scrub nurses must know where materials needed for various procedures can be located, and they must know what kind of setup and specific instruments individual surgeons and specific procedures will require. Nurses, assisted by the surgeons, keep count of small items used during surgery, sponges, pieces of suture, needles, pints of blood. They also keep track of the instruments. They use various technologies that range from a needle's original packaging and I read a fascinating thing that says if you open up the little package of needles, because they'll come slotted into a little uh, plastic thing, that if you open it up and it doesn't have the required number of needles, you have to close it back up, set it aside, but make sure that it stays there so that you can finish the count at the end and double check that everything is still okay. Um, so they also use count sheets, like this one. I don't know how visible this is, but what you can see in the list are various names of instruments and various types of them, how many you're going to have in a specific kit for a specific operation, and you're going to make sure that this, the count matches from the beginning to the end. Um, and there are really two reasons to do this, this. The first and most important is to make sure that stuff doesn't may remain inside the patient's body where it can cause infection and incredible problems. And this happens um, more often than people want to talk about. Um, the second reason is to keep track of the materials used for inventory and billing pr purposes. Um, and nurses do counts of things like needles and swabs at critical moments during the procedure. So for example, when the patient's opened up, there will have been a count done right before. As they close successive layers of the patient's tissues, they'll do a count at each, before each part is closed, and then they'll do one at the end. Um, so the nurses have primary responsibility for keeping track of these instruments and materials, and they're the locus of accounting control in the operating room. And accounting control is my phrase. Although nurses have primary responsibility for maintaining these counts, surgeons help them ensure that the count's accurate. In addition to, in addition to helping search when a count comes up short, surgeons often will get the scrub nurse's attention to ensure that the nurse has accounted for a swab or needle before discarding it. So if you can imagine, if there's four people, surgeons, working in the patient's body, the scrub nurse isn't necessarily going to notice when the fellow ditches a swab unless the fellow gets the nurse's attention. Um, so the responsibility for materials is somewhat distributed among surgeons, nurses, and surgeons. And in this case, although Marcos, the fellow, finds the sponge, the non-sterile circulating nurse picks it up and Jane, the scrub nurse, checks it off her list. And although I've called this accounting control, these practices entail a form of surveillance, which is often implicit in various definitions of the term control. Jane, the nurse, challenges the surgeon's work by demanding that they account for the whereabouts of the sponge. Nurses have less power than physicians, but Jane is helped by the count itself. This official count exerts agency over the surgeons, who might ignore a nurse under some circumstances, but who can't ignore the problem of a dis discrepancy in the count. The operation has to stop. Nurses perform other duties related to surveillance and control. They monitor adherence to sterility rules, keeping staff, visitors, and trainees away from tables containing sterile instruments and from the parts of the patient that are considered sterile. Sterile areas can be accessed only by people who are scrubbed and gowned, and everyone else entering the operating room has to wear scrubs. So, so basically, everybody has to put scrubs on in a changing room, but those people who are going to be in the sterile area have to put on a second gown. Um, and everybody else has to wear a cap, booties, a mask, but people who are outside that area don't have to put, and that's just to be in the whole op area of operating suites in a hospital. Um, but no scrubbing is or gowning is required for people who are, inside, or who are outside the operating field. So nurses main con maintain control over the spaces and materials of surgery. Um, second example. At a critical moment of a difficult bile duct surgery, the anesthesiologist monitor broke down. Low blood pressure is the ideal state for this type of operation, 
So the anesthesiologist has to pharmacologically keep the pressure down while watching to ensure that it doesn't dip too low. And the photo I'm about to show you is not from the surgery in which the machines broke down, but this is a minimally invasive um, elbow surgery. This uh, person here is the surgeon. This is the surgical fellow. This is the anesthesiologist. And this is the bank of machines that he's looking at to monitor the patient's vital signs. What you, what's hard to s really hard to see in this picture is that the blood pressure is actually shown right here. Um, and the machines actually, the ones that, that I'm talking about in this example, the machine actually had them much bigger and in red numbers, but same thing. And both surgeons and well, the, the anesthesiologist is going to monitor some of the finer points of what's on that incredible bank of machines there. The surgeons need to be able to see the blood pressure. So it's set up so that both parties can watch it. Um, so if the pressure drops, blood pressure drops, surgeons have to step away to give anesthesiologists time to raise it. And late in this long operation, the blood pressure readout plunged. Glancing at it, Dr. Jill English, the chief resident, asked, is this a real number? The anesthesia resident, Dr. Simon Blanchot, insisted that the numbers reflected a problem with the machine, not with the patient's body. The evidently seamless, if temporary, melding of human and machine had suddenly become problematic. The team proceeded. Dr. Nick Parada, the chief surgeon, sent Simon to locate the staff anesthesiologist, who arrived promptly. Nick repeatedly asked the anesthesiologists if the patient's blood pressure was okay. Each time he asked, he placed his hand inside the abdominal cavity and lifted his eyes back to the monitors. The anesthesiologist insisted that everything was fine while they fiddled with wires trying to get the monitor to work. And I was actually standing behind the, the drape that, that separates anesthesiologists from surgeons while all this was going on, although I stepped out to let them work. But I was watching, and they're basically under the patient table, messing around with wires, flicking switches, trying to get, figure out what it was that had gone wrong. I, I didn't get an exact <laughs> uh, picture of what it was that had gone wrong, but they were just busily working under there, and the surgeons were waiting, were just kept operating because they kept insisting that the blood pressure was fine. They also had a manual backup that was basically under the table, so with a you know, traditional blood pressure cuff and thing, but the surgeons couldn't see it. So the surgeons finished the last steps of this operation without the benefit of a monitor that, the that they could see. After the operation, I asked Nick, the surgeon, what had happened. He said, I could feel the aorta beating under my hand. Each time he placed his hand inside the abdomen, the strong pulse from the aorta, which is the largest artery in the body, told him the patient's heart was pumping blood through his body just fine, defying the numbers on the screen. The monitor and patient's aorta told him two different things. I would have preferred the numbers, Nick said, wanting numerical proof of what he could feel with his hand. The monitor also could offer precision about the patient's blood pressure that Nick's hand could not. Anesthesia entails a process of first relaxing the patient, sometimes with comforting words, usually with a cocktail of drugs, then monitoring vital signs and tweaking, tweaking drugs during the procedure, then bringing the patient back to consciousness. Anesthesiologists use drugs to render each phase as predictable as possible despite the differences among individual patients. As surgery begins, anesthesiologists poke patients up to monitors with highly visible panels that display the blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturation of the blood, other vital signs. These machines can tell physicians whether a patient is in distress when the patient is unable to speak. An anesthetized patient can only signal distress by emitting bodily signs, such an as an increase or decrease in blood pressure. So the monitors amplify those signals dramatically. This gives the patient a stronger voice in the proceedings. By signaling distress or an important transitional moment, such as the drugs taking full effect or drugs wearing off, the patient's body, as amplified by monitors, assists in the surgical process. The signals are so critical to successful surgical work that redundant systems make it possible to check blood pressure and other signs by other means. In this case, Nick's hand on the aorta provided the most important backup. But Nick didn't tell other team members, surgeons or anesthesiologists, that he was checking blood pressure with his hand. He said this to me after the surgery and out of the presence of other team members. As a senior surgeon, Nick had multiple responsibilities during the surgery. <coughs> 
His first responsibility was to do everything possible to ensure a positive outcome for the patient. The second was to teach his residents surgical craft and surgical decision making. Nick was ultimately responsible also for the entire operation and the proceedings in the operating room. But this is a delicate business. Anesthesiologists and nurses are subordinate to surgeons, um, but they also work within separate hierarchies requiring separate skills. While Nick reassured himself, he also maintained the boundaries that separ separate surgeons from anesthesiologists, leaving public responsibility for providing blood pressure information to the anesthesiologist while privately reassuring, insur reassuring himself that it was accurate. This instance of unarticulated knowledge, in the sense developed by Tim Choi, maintains an appearance that anesthesia and surgery are separate domains governed by separate types of expertise. Although a blood pressure reading is produced by the linked patients and monitor, the patient's body is the surgeon's domain, whereas the monitor is the anesthesiologist's domain. Surveillance in anesthesia takes several forms. Monitors externalize the patient's vital signs in a highly visible way. The display gives surgeons access to much of the same information as anesthesiologists to check on the patient's status. The monitors, like the count, give team members ways to challenge or question each other across fields. In this case, Jill, the chief president, looked at the readout, then asked whether the extremely low blood pressure numbers were real. So in this case, Jill, the surgeon, questioned the anesthesiologists. But I've also seen anesthesiologists who observe signs of distress or instability in a patient and ask the surgeon to stop work while they deepen the anesthesia. This kind of precise pharmacological determination of a patient's body chemistry and consciousness is homeostatic control, the maintenance of an artificial equilibrium within the patient's body. Anesthesia is a process during which control for maintaining the patient's vital functions shifts from patient to anesthesiologist and back to patient. Thus, anesthesia, anesthesia artificially constructs a homeostasis that differs dramatically from a waking human body, a homeostasis that can be continually adjusted and then further altered to return the body first to waking and later to something closer to its normal state. During the frequent lulls during surgery, I watched several anesthesia residents study long lists of drugs and their effects, suggesting that control over the poisoning effects of anesthesia comes in part from a mastery of a vast pharmacopoeia. So these guys have lots of downtime in an operation that's going normally if it's a long procedure. So they're sitting there with a notebook, literally memorizing names of drugs and their effects and, count and counterindications and you know, what doesn't mix well with what, um, to really try to master the drugs that they have to work with. The control that anesthesiologists have over the human body states of consciousness and pain is extraordinary. During another teaching surgery, I observed Julie Martinez, a chief resident, perform her first minimally invasive hernia surgery. Though Julie had four years of her surgery experience, she was new to minimally invasive surgery and was just learning to repair hernias. And this is where we're going to have our multimedia part of our presentation. Um, so hernias happen where you have an opening in the body and the opening widens more than it should and stuff goes through. So inguinal hernias are the, some of the most common. And what you have is an area in the abdomen. You have, um, particularly in men, where you have an opening that's allowing blood vessels and um, uh, various reproductive, um, I don't want to say ducts, tubes, um, to pass through to the penis. And that creates a hole in the abdomen that then occasionally gets widened and stuff starts to slide through. So that's what an inguinal hernia is, and that's why it's more common in men than women, although it can happen in women. Um, so what I'm going to draw for you, because this picture is not very good, this picture is so trying to show you sort of the insides and outsides of what's going on in a, in a minimally invasive hernia operation. But what it looks like is... You want to be Vanna White? We can just do this this way. All right. So what you have is a space that looks like this. And this is the camera's view looking at the abdominal wall from above, basically. And set up from above, yeah. So what you also have is, do this in another color. That's all right. I think we're all right. What you also have is a bunch of 
stuff, this is blood vessels, nerves, various things that are passing through this little hole. And when you have a hernia, the hole gets a little bit bigger, and you have also then often bits of like intestinal stuff that comes through. So if you look at a picture of somebody with a hernia on the outside, I Googled, Googled it, it's not pretty, so if you don't want this image in your head, don't Google it. Um, but what it, look, what it looks like is a kind of a, a lump or a bump or sometimes something actually very large sticking out of the abdomen in, you know, under the skin. So what the surgeon has to do is first to pull all this stuff back and it gets, it gets stuck in there and it gets kind of attached. So you've got to loosen it up and pull it back. And then what the surgeon does is makes a, a little flap in the abdominal wall that looks like this and inserts something that's basically looks like a little window screen, it's a little mesh. Inserts the mesh into here and tacks it down with things that look a little bit like corkscrews. And this is all, I think, for all its high techness, it's actually relatively primitive. Um, that's, I can just sort of show that. But, so what this, yeah, against the glass. So what the, um, what this resident is going to do is place the mesh. And this guy actually has herniated sections on both sides of the opening. So there's going to be two meshes placed, but she only places one. Um, so Julie was just beginning to learn the techniques of minimally invasive surgery. Dr. Tom Berg, the staff physician, helped Julie place ports inside the man's <coughs> abdomen. The ports are the holes where the minimally invasive camera and the instruments will go in. Um, Tom used the laparoscope to point out the two herniated areas of the man's abdomen and then pointed out the blood vessels leading from abdomen to testicles. Julie put up her hand, palm out, and leaned back as though pushing her body away from the ves vessels. Stay away, she said, mock seriously. Tom pointed to a structure that he called the vast difference, which actually was the vast deference, the tube that carries sperm to the urethra. Though many medical mnemonics for anatomical structures are sexual, this one is particularly potent because it plays on gendered anatomical differences between men and women. Tom then pointed to a few more blood vessels, saying Julie should be extra careful to avoid them because they would bleed excessively if nicked. This narration of the anatomy created common surgical and epistemological ground in the patient's body, grounding abstract and anatomical knowledge in the specifics of the individual patient. What it also does is it constructs out of this two-dimensional image a three-dimensional space because the vessels actually are coming towards you and the hole is sort of receding away from you. But it's in this particular kind of image, most of this is just basically looks like an anatomical wall with stuff passing through. But you have to be aware that the stuff passing through is not in the same plane as the abdominal wall. Um, Tom told Julie to make a large flap out of the abdominal wall, which is this flap here into which you would insert a mesh to reinforce the wall. He said, you want to start your flap way up high towards this vessel. So he's using the vessels to help her navigate. Teaching minimally invasive procedures is a lot more difficult than teaching open surgery because in op with open surgery, a surgeon can use a pointer to say you want to start here. Um, or, you know, so way, so he has to find words to describe what in, in an open surgery he would actually do with a pointer, which is a lot more subliminal for the um, trainee. Um, supervisors also have a lot less direct control over residents' actions doing minimal ease of invasive surgery, which makes it more difficult to prevent them from making mistakes. Julie worked with tiny scissors and with a harmonic scalpel, which actually uses sound rather than a blade to cut. Um, and these are threaded through small holes in the abdomen. So you can see in this picture would be the Two things with handles are scissors and uh, some form of cutting device. Um, so she's starting to work to try to open this flap. And Tom says, I think your hands are reversed, but let's see how you do. So Julie's hands look tangled up with each other as she was holding the long handles of the laparoscopic instruments. And either Tom did not think this was a big problem or he wanted her to discover for herself what would work best. In an environment of genuinely disciplinary control, such as the 18th century military drills that Michel Foucault describes, trainees have strict requirements for each movement. But surgical practice has to help trainees also develop confidence and autonomy. Within the limits of safety, 
supervisors can allow trainees to sort out some of the bodily actions on their own. As Julie continued to dissect the flap, Tom described the landmarks and the procedures. You're going to take that line down along the ligament later, he told her. And you're going to make three quarters of a square. This is how far laterally you're going to get, maybe another inch. Use the back of your scissors to pull the fat away and develop the plane. So part of what she has to do is to make this flap very visible. And part of making it visible is to remove enough flat or fat, excuse me, that she can actually see the muscular wall behind it. Um, you want to cover your defect. There's your vessel up and to the left. You want to get that peritoneum out. So she's trying to begin to pull stuff away from where she's trying to work. While Tom narrated the procedure, Julie worked silently to create the flap. She cleared away crump crumpled peritoneal tissue that crowded into the defect and escaped through the abdominal wall. As she pulled the tissue out of the herniated area, she began to see the hernia more clearly. Her concentration was total. She bobbed her head to either side of the camera as though to get a better view, even though moving her body could not have changed the relationship to Im the images on the two-dimensional screen. So she's doing what we would do if we're trying to get a better, if I'm trying to get a better view of Tim, I might go to one side and then go to the other side. But if I'm looking at Kim Tim with a camera, I can't do this and get a better picture of him. Um, so she's, she's She's acting as if she's in three-dimensional space while looking at a two-dimensional image. And I've never seen other surgeons do this. Um, and I think it's a, it's a product of being very new to this kind of procedure and new to working on a screen. Um, so only moving the camera could have helped Julie. But her bobbing suggests that she'd not yet embodied the relationship between the two-dimensional monitor and the patient's three-dimensional abdomen a relationship that surgeons develop over years of practice doing this kind of surgery. The movement was extraneous, and more experienced surgeons still their bodies to prevent inadvertent movements of instruments, making their own bodies the most significant instruments of surgical control. While intensely focused on dissecting the abdominal wall, Julie nicked a nearby blood vessel. Blood began to leak into the abdomen. She muttered a curse. A nurse rushed out of the room to locate a clip annoying Tom, who said one should have been in the room. When she returned, Julie easily placed the clip on the, on the leaking vessel. Then she sheepishly asked Tom if he'd like to handle the second herniated area on the other side. Let's not worry about it, Tom reassured her. It's part of surgery. You do something wrong and you fix it. I'd lost the vessels, she said. You have to ask yourself what could go wrong here, he replied. The brief exchange speaks volumes about surgical training. Perfect control may be a goal, but it's also an impossibility. Surgeons slip, and they learn to fix their mistakes rapidly and without fuss. Julie's response is exemplary. She reviewed her error. She also revealed the danger of focusing too narrowly. She lost, she lost sight of the blood vessels and nicked ones. So she has to keep some focus around the periphery of where she's working, because there's stuff that could be damaged by losing sight of things like blood vessels. Um, Tom told her to check the larger area for potential danger. This was one reason to name the vessels as they came into view. Instead, Julie had yet to learn to widen her frame to consider what might go wrong in the area surrounding the spot where she worked. She had yet to master bodily control over her movements and her instruments. She also had yet to develop a wider perceptual sense as the of the surgical field as it's depicted on the monitor. Tom instructed Julie to pull some fat away from the abdominal wall. Grab the fat hand over hand, he said, which actually means with the instruments, not literally. You see that white part? That's the fascia. Then Tom pointed to several structures that had become much more visible on the left side of the screen. So the screen was actually shifted sort of this way to make this more visible. So the structure started to become, come into view on the left side of the screen. Um, that's his testicle and that's the vas. Obviously that stays, Tom said. Julie let the piece of tissue she was grasping slip. Oof, that's frustrating, she said. You're doing fine, Tom replied. There's the spermatic cord there. You want to leave the cord, please. It's a man thing. Jokes in the opera, and obviously he's, he's clearly playing on the gendered part of this to kind of play up the jokes. Um, but it, jokes in the operating room focus on the moments of greatest danger, typically occurring after such dangers have been surmounted and order restored. Jokes like Tom serve a pedagogical purpose. They virtually reopen the moment 
giving the trainee a chance to glimpse the danger it contained for the patient's well-being or the resident's career, then they leave the moment of danger in the past. The joke has a double effect of revealing and minimizing the danger, teaching it as a, as a hazard a well-trained surgeon can learn to avoid. After Julie's mistake, Tom verbally reasserted the need for control and the consequences of a slip. The joke reminded Julie of the ethical and technical stakes. Slips cause harm. Maintaining control of one's actions and one's awareness of the outer horizon can limit that harm. Now, for those of you who just become convinced that you will never, ever go to a teaching hospital, uh, let me, for, a, for any kind of surgical procedure, let me give you a little bit of reassurance. This is actually this intensely supervised relationship in which the junior surgeons, the residents, fellows, uh, some medical students, are watching every move the senior surgeon makes, both technically and in terms of larger behavioral comportment issues, while the senior surgeon is literally directing, sometimes actually with their hands on the resident's body, the movements. And studies have shown that this is actually, outcomes in these kinds of situations are often better, typically better than when that kind of careful monitoring, careful surveillance is not there. Um, so, young residents do slip, but things get fixed, and usually the slips are not serious because everybody, starting with the patient, but everybody would pay a really high price. Um, accounting control, homeostatic control, and body control are all operating room practices intended to protect patients. But why focus on control at all? And why focus on control across the entire operating team? The number of ethnographies that focus on operating room practice is surprisingly small, and I'm, I, I think there are people in this room who are going to fix that, but for the moment, that's where it is. With the exception of Don Goodwin's work on anesthetics, most ethnographies of surgical practice focus on surgeons and more specifically on the actions and decisions of senior surgeons. These ethnographies typically take one of two approaches. The first focus is on the social relations of surgeons, including means of reinforcing roles, evaluations of competence, and the social and institutional difficulties created by surgeons' power. Ethnographies of surgeons' social relations describe common character traits of surgeons, such as their confidence, decisiveness, heroic self-image, and macho attitudes. These accounts typically contain few detailed descriptions of surgical operating practices and tend to examine surgical subjectivity as already constituted, as though surgeons are born, not made. Ethnographies taking a second approach contain a wealth of detail about how the socio-technical practices of surgery make the operating team a surgeon body, in the words of one ethnographer, a money-armed, multi-skilled operator united by the attending surgeon. These sociological contributions make the forces and agencies of the surgical system apparent by showing the relationship between the surgeon's structural position in the surgical team and his or her power. They also have the curious effect of both heightening the senior surgeon's hierarchical power as the entity that coordinates all those arms and flattening the distinctions that one can make among senior surgeons and other members of the operating team, including technical abilities and reasons for being in the operating room. All of these ethnographies, again with the one exception of a uh, rather good ethnography of anesthesia, typically leave the work of anesthesiologists and nurses more or less on the periphery. And I could find no ethnographic work that examined interactions among different types of surgical experts. This privileges the role of surgeons, especially the chief surgeon, in achieving surgical success. Further, it obscures the ways in which teams form interacting and layered domains of expertise. So I, what I want to do is to move the focus of surgical observation away from the senior, senior surgeon, whether imagined as a decisive heroic figure or as the programmed intelligence operating a cyborg of limbs, instruments, and machines with many subordinate parts. Instead, I think surgery has to be examined as a complex social and socio-technical system. And I don't think that this is rocket science, but it hasn't been done. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. The first reason to look at the entire operating team goes back to surgery's relations to industrial practices. By looking at the whole team, we see surgery is much more entwined with ideologies of control that have dominated European and American projects, at least since the Enlightenment, connecting operating room practices to control in other domains 
allows us to see techniques like accounting for, for sponges and amplifying vital signs as general solutions to operational problems, solutions that arose under specific historical and social conditions, but not necessarily conditions that are 100% related to surgery. Um, these kinds of solutions have come up in lots of places. The operating room is a space of enclosure in the Deleuzian sense that its productive forces are greater than the sum of its parts, but it's not a closed system. Showing practice of, as con of control as part of a larger socio-historical trend helps locate surgery in cultural context. The second reason to look at teams goes back to the problem that I identified with the literature on surgical ethnographies. The same rationality that produced powerful control techniques for counting, monitoring, and disciplining also produced the myth of the individual rational thinker who either runs the show or who is the show. The problem with the surgical ethnographic literature is that even authors trying to depart from the figure of the decisive heroic surgeon end up reinstating that surgeon as a subject position in total control of a subordinate group of people. But a look at the whole system of surgery shows that, to put, and I can put this in a Latorian idi idiom, a dirty sponge or a low blood pressure reading can stop senior surgeons at work. Put in a more classical social, social, science, social science terms, every member of the operating room team has a role to play in protecting the patient, ensuring the desired outcome. Sometimes this requires using techniques of control to challenge the senior surgeon and other members of the surgical team. The significance of this goes beyond the important but insufficient acknowledgement of the power of subalterns to speak. It has quite specific significance in several areas of medical research. For example, sociologist Jessica Messman has argued that medical safety has to be examined not only in terms of ne negative events that have to be rectified, but also in terms of all the techniques that make positive outcomes commonplace. Clearly, the kinds of distributed techniques and responsibilities that I've described here contribute to successful outcomes. Yet many solutions to issues of patient safety focus on individual actions. Protocols, for example, tend to script the work of individuals but lose the work of the collective. The push to improve outcomes by teaching medical ethics also, for all the field's good intentions, has similar problems. With its roots and philosophies of rational deliberation, medical ethics is simply too individual, too abstract, and too narrowly focused on correct conduct as a moral achievement to account for the activities of an entire operating team. I find it really difficult to think of finding a wayward sponge as a moral achievement, but I don't find it difficult to think of it as a function of socio-technical practice. To bring this to, this to a conclusion, um, I've used Miriam Levin's phrase, ideologies of control, a couple of times in this talk without defining it. For Levin, ideologies of control refer to practices and symbolics of control as they've been rooted in particular historical developments of European and American mechanistic thought and technology development. I want to conclude here by referring to Clifford Goertz's def definitions of ideology as, quote, patterns of interlocking meanings, end quote, and as, quote, schematic images of social order, end quote. While Goertz focused on the symbolics of ideology, I don't think I do him any injustice to suggest that the meanings and images he discussed can be grounded in actual practices and technologies, including counting, maintaining a homeostasis, or disciplining one's body. That's clearly the sense in which I use ideology of control to describe surgical techniques of control. But Gertz also contrasts florid ideological language to the drier language of science and argues that ideological language may, quote, draw its power from its capacity to grasp, formulate, and communicate social realities that elude the tempered language of science, that it may mediate more complex meanings than its literal meaning suggests, end quote. Thus, Gertz points to the need for concepts that capture not only rational elements of social existence, but also elements that elude such ra rationality. I began this essay with my first encounter with the language of control in a surgeon's description of her work as controlled violence. The phrase captures the central contradiction of surgical treatment. Biomedical, especially surgical practices, do a great deal of violence to patient bodies in the interest of healing them. Every time a surgeon makes an incision, or an anesthesiologist administers a drug that renders a patient deeply unconscious, the physician does violence to the patient's body. This violence must be controlled. Thus, techniques of control, techniques that guide the actions of an entire operating team, become the means of constraining surgical violence so that violence done to bodies in the interest of healing does not become harm 
patience. Thank you. Don't forget this slide.